it's an honor to have you with us today to share your story and your accomplishment. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. Can you speak about this ethics training manual that you put together for the Nigerian judiciary? Judiciary, yes. Um, yes. When I, in between jobs, when I was in between jobs, when I left the Gambia or ceremoniously <laughs> and um, came to Nigeria, just before the Commonwealth was sent into Solomons, the UNODC, United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime, um, they had this program um, training judges uh, on judicial ethics, and they brought me in as a consultant. And wow, to tell it was a whole new world for me. There was an international consultant already who was, you know, supposed to deal with this matter. He was British, so he brought um, some, you know, some of these uh, international principles like the, what do you call it, all these uh, principles on judicial, what, what, you know, Latima House, this, and so, you know, a couple of things he put together. But he didn't have the Nigerian content. Mm -hmm. And I was, try I was asked to make it, you know, so that we can have ownership to deal with it. It was when I started looking at that, you know, a, a doing putting this manual together that I realized I came to realize a lot of things you know and everywhere I turned like you open a newspaper you see obituary announcements oh such and so, such a judge has lost their mother and I look at the people who have put this obituary announcement it's a group of lawyers and they say oh committee of friends and things like that and then I got, I started talking to some judges and magistrates and lawyers and so on. And, you know, we have our culture here. We're African. Mm -hmm. And in Nigeria, we have our culture. Like if you lose a family member, you lose your father, your mother, your husband, wife, or something like that, or your child, or some other relative, generally it is the, the burial, <laughs> or like in the Western world, we don't invite people to burials as such. Everybody who hears you've lost someone turns up for the burial. That's how it's done. So if you make a budget about feeding people, you don't know how many thousand people you're going to feed. You have to look at the family, uh, all the people that might be coming because of uh, 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 the wife, the husband, the whoever, the whatever. Oh, this one is a politician. That one is a, a lawyer. That one is a doctor. That one, you know, and you make an estimate. That, and you find that you, you know in your mind there'll be so many people. So we don't invite people to funerals and burials. People come as a mark of courtesy. That is our tradition. Now, the, what happens is that for a judge, what are the implications? You find that some people who are litigants in your court are going to turn up because they hear you lost your mother or your husband or your whatever. And normally when we go to these places, we go with gifts. Mm -hmm. We go with gifts. But, and some, you know, generally it should be something on the average. But there are people who will come with a cow. They will come with a big, you know, envelope of money, full of money. They will come with, um, you know, cartons and cases of drinks and so on and so forth. And, you know. So what do you do as a judge when you know that this litigant is only coming here to seek my attention in the hope to rule in his favor? Those are the kind of things that happen. And you cannot say, I don't want certain people at this burial mm -hmm. because you belong in a family. But of course, you know, when people are coming there because they are seeking your attention, because they want some favors from you, it happens to judges. And then how do lawyers who appear before you do an obituary announcement for your mother? And they call themselves committee of friends. There's something unethical about it. Mm -hmm. Something that's not quite right. Because if this committee of friends, <laughs> if some of them tomorrow have a matter before me. They're not stopped. I mean, nobody's going to stop them 
their cases from coming to my court. So if they come to my court and I rule and rule against them because that's the right thing to do. Of course, you're going to hear comments like, imagine when she buried her mother, I know the presence I took there. <laughs> I know I made the contributions I made, you know, because this is Africa, you know? So this is just an example of some of the things, you know, you needed to work out when you talk about ethics for judges. So you then worked on that guide for ethics to try to give judges some kind of roadmap. Yes, and a roadmap. Like a roadmap, an ethical roadmap to figure out what behavior is acceptable and what behavior is not. The other thing that you've done so much in, and I noticed that you've even done it pro bono, you've done it free, is teaching. You've already said your passion, one of your passions was teaching and you wanted to be an academic. So would you share with us why you think the teaching has played such an important role in your life and how it has affected others? Yes, I I kind of think that, well, I've said it before, I wanted to be an academic. And if I didn't end up as a lawyer and a judge, (laughs) I should be, I will be teaching. And I think the most gratifying thing about being a teacher is knowing that you're influencing people, you're influencing thought, and that at the end of the day, what you are teaching is being put to use. That is not to say that your students wouldn't have opinions that would differ and so on, but you know that you are in a position to mold minds. You know, when I went to Namdi Azikiwe University here in uh, Nigeria, um, they had a faculty of law, of course, but I was very involved in activism in, um, you know, I was very much a part of the Nigeria civil society, especially uh, leading up to Beijing, post Beijing and so on, you know, and I used to be chairperson of the International Federation of Women Lawyers in my state. FIDA. Yes, FIDA. <laughs> and so I was, I think I, I can, and say I was very well known for, you know, being involved with women's rights. And so I was invited by the, uh, by the law faculty at Namdi Azikwe University to start a new course on women and minority rights law. They didn't have the course. But, you know, I, because of, uh, at that time, there was a lot of talk out there about the rights of women. And gender studies and gender issues had become a big issue that people couldn't ignore. And so the university invited me and said, we want to start this course. Can you help us? We want you to work it out. What are we going to be? And we want you to start teaching it. (laughs) To tell the truth, I didn't have a clue. But I went back because I also was, um, I also had um, uh, 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 the Makato Award you know, at that time, I was a Makato awardee doing, um, doing a, a private pro- project on advocacy about women's rights, advocacy to the legislature, the judiciary, the police, and so on. I was doing a lot of also teaching in police colleges, pro bono, of course, on women's rights. So I had to sit up and start working out a curriculum what are the issues? What are the topics? What are we going to be talking about? What shall we teach? And I didn't know. I think at that time, a few other Nigerian universities were also beginning to try to look into gender studies, especially in the faculty of law. So, but it, it wasn't exactly happening. So there was, I couldn't run to this university or that university and say, can I have your curriculum? What are you teaching? I had to make it up. <laughs> I had to make it all up by myself. Of course, with advice from friends and other colleagues, you know, we're going to talk, be talking about who are, when we talk about women and minorities, why do you put women and minorities in the same basket? Because these are people, you know, who are disadvantaged. Because maybe because of the society, I mean, women have always been disadvantaged. Mm-hmm. So have minorities and other kinds of people. And then what do we do? We, I, you know, we begin to look at all the things 
that happen, especially locally, you know, which means that women are treated like mini persons. You look at issues like widowhood in this country, in Nigeria, in my own ethnic group, it was terrible, but a lot has improved. A lot has changed. If you get to hear the stories of what used to happen to women because they were widowed, first of all, you are the chief suspect in your husband's death. Oh, you're not supposed to sit on a chair. You have to sit on the floor. You're not supposed to have a bath. I mean, there were lots of things. And then we went on to look at issues like, okay, what do we do for women and minorities? We talk about affirmative action, you know. So I had to work out a whole curriculum on the matters, you know, bordering on women's human rights and gender, you know, gender rights that we needed to, you know, teach. And happily, and, yeah. No, I started, go ahead. Yeah, I started happily. teaching. I taught the, in my first year, I started teaching the undergraduate class and the master's class at the same time, you know. And um, I must say, I trained a handful, I trained a, a core of women and men in that class. Today, a good number of them are professors. They've gone on and they have made great achievements. They've made publications, they've published books on women's rights issues and so on. You know, so that is, you know, this is the power of imparting knowledge because the people that you teach, of course, eventually will be much greater than you. They will do greater things. They will build on what you've taught them and they will go places, you know, and that is, that's why they say that teachers' rewards are in heaven or whatever. I don't right, know. right, right. <laughs> you know, I, I am reminded by your story of the great, incredible, iconic Ruth Bader Ginsburg, Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg yes. in our country, yes. who put together the, the, the first, first yeah. she did the first case book on women's rights. Mm -hmm. She created the first law journal on women's rights and taught mm -hmm. the first course on women's rights when Indeed. she was a when she was a professor so so i am just thinking about that parallel i i wanted to ask you a question about family i know that our time is short mm -hmm. and so with all of the different struggles and challenges that you've had how mm -hmm. have you balanced your professional life and all the that you have faced with your family i think it, when you when you talk about family a woman's life is tough in Africa, especially a professional woman. In fact, every woman, when you, especially when you have family, I had little children all this while that, you know, and we were all growing up together. I had a husband, I had his, you know, he's passed now, but I had these little children to take care of. I had, I don't, I, I don't know how I did it, but, but the good thing is that when I grew, when I was growing and, you know, doing all the things I was doing, my children, there are four girls and a boy. Everybody was on board. When I had to do things, sometimes they, are, they were the ones who were typing up things for me and so on and so forth. But when it comes to family life, it was difficult because you were always looking for nannies, you were always trying to balance. Um, when the children have eaten breakfast and everybody has eaten breakfast, you are immediately you start thinking, what about lunch? <laughs> After that, you are thinking, what about dinner? You know, and um, you know, your girls, they are in school or they go to boarding school and you have to go on visiting days and I can, it was tough, but we're able to do it. So that when I see young people today and they complain, I tell them you can do it. It is a cycle. I don't know how to, how do I put it? It's a cycle or something. You know, it is something that every woman goes through. Even if it is not your own biological children, mm -hmm. you raise many other children. You raise many others, relatives, non-relatives, and so on. Because when you have family, it's not even about who is your biological child. So it was tough, I must say. But one was able to, you know, you are carrying a baby, in one hand, you are writing a judgment with the other. We did it all. We did it. I, they say well, women are good at multitasking. We did it. And 
Honestly, that's what I can say because I look back at today and I ask myself, how did you even do that? Right. <laughs> it was tough. Yeah, yeah. And very tough today. Same challenges that women face today. Same thing, same thing. Same thing. And so you would say, don't give up, hang in there, hang try in to there. find support yes. for you yes. uh, and, and do the best that you do the best that you can exactly. be, be be the best do do your best and i i tell young people time will sort you out because as you continue to put in all the effort and do your best it's only a matter of time when you've paid your dues you'll be shocked and you you know at the results and you'll be asking yourself how did i do this when did i do that how was i even able to we will survive and we will multitask and we will survive. We will survive. And your ability to keep going. The other thing that to me shouts out is when a door closes, it means another opportunity will be there in another door. Another sure. one will open. So as hard as things may seem, Yes. And as awful and difficult as things may seem, when you stand up and you do the right thing, there is something behind the door. There is, you know, the, the now, like the 10 years later, you're getting that reward. Now you're getting all this recognition. But then when you left Gambia, there was another door to open for you for the next step of your career. True, true. And that mentor, that gentleman that, wanted you at the beginning to think about being a magistrate there were many hands we we know there were many challenges and those that yeah. were against you but yes. there were hands extended to you to oh, help many, oh many many of them many of them i i keep saying it you know when you think about the number of people who supported you along the way there's no way i mean it's it will be difficult to see someone else in need of your guidance or assistance and look away. When I think of the kind of people who supported me, the many hands, whether it was through advice, you know, lending a helping hand in my career, mentoring me, or the former Inspector General of Police and the President of Nigeria, keeping me alive and safe, or Amnesty International coming to my rescue, or interrites, or I mean, I just owe my life, my career, my achievements to so many people, to so many people and everywhere, you, all over the world. And in part, that is why you give back to so many people. True? I have to. I have to. We have to give back to society that has made us who we are. We, it is a, it's a debt we owe to give back and to continue to give back. And so my final question, debt to give back, because we owe so many and we, we, we need to give back to our society, such an important, such an important principle that you have lived with. Let me ask you this final question. When all is said and done, what do you want your legacy to be? What do you want people to say about you? Your, your, what, what your life has meant, what you've done in your life, what is your legacy? I think um, what I want people to say of me, I know that already if, um, people will say, oh, you don't know Justice Izuako. If you're talking about corrupt practices or whatnot, you know, all the, you know, unfortunate things that happen these days. They'll say, oh, no, no, no. You don't know Justice Zwerko. You're not, you know, you're not, um, you don't understand who she is. Why do you make an offer to her? She's just the wrong person. So I think my legacy really is that I can stand up and be counted for doing my best, just only doing my best to be ethical, making whatever little sacrifice I could make. Because if, like in the Gambia, I had said, okay, this is what Yaya Jame wants, we'll give him the judgment he wants, which is what some of my colleagues did. 
where would I be today? What would have happened? All I would have earned was a bad name. And so what I want my legacy to, to be is that I was able, in the, I was courageous enough. I was able in the face of, uh, shall I say, even my colleagues, some of my colleagues trying to avoid me, you know, calling me controversial. The people in, people in authority thinking they could punish me Send me to send me to all kinds of um, places on transfer, you know, places nobody wanted to go to. Send me to Siberia or whatever, you know. Knowing that, in spite of all of that, I was able to stand tall. I think that is what I want my legacy to be: that I'll stand tall. I don't even know where we are heading. When I I'm, and when I say this, I'm talking about life in general. But I want to know that I can answer, I can give an account. I am not afraid that anybody is going to come after me and say, how did you come about this? How did you get that? Uh, we've looked in at your account and you have this much money. Where did it come from? I know that I can walk around freely and breathe the air freely. And I'm not afraid. And I can stand tall and I can be accountable. And in spite of everything, I am still standing. Mm -hmm. I think there's no greater legacy for me. And I hope and I pray that my own children and others coming after me will at least be able to borrow a leaf, you know, from the way I have lived my life. I haven't been a saint, but certainly I believe I have something that I can hand on. And I believe that there are things good things that I have had in, handed on. So talking about a legacy, it is one of respect. It is one of trust. It is one of, you know, rise courage, rising tall against all odds. And I think it is possible with anyone who, who tries. I think it's possible. And you know what, Justice? All I can say to that is amen. amen. We began this interview with, me saying what an extraordinary, brilliant, amazing career that you've had. And all I can say is amen. If we could all live up to the standards that you have lived up to, all could stand up and work hard. And just your last line, you're still standing. And so again, I say amen. And thank you so much, Justice, for participating in this conversation, for being who you are, for being that beacon of hope and light and justice and ethics in our world. We so, so appreciate the time you've spent with us. Thank you so much. Thank you, Judge Williams. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it.